Hello and welcome to Wide Angle. Two historic elections have taken place in West Asia and what the West calls the Middle East. The election in Egypt, 85, 90 million people, and another election in uh, Syria, 23 to 25 million people. Now we shall discuss the consequences of these elections. Now these elections are, have been very divisive for the Arab world itself. The West is divided on both these elections. And we shall wait for the ambassador of Egypt in New Delhi, Khaled Bakhli, to join us. And then we shall discuss Egypt too. To begin with, my panel is um, Wael Awad, the senior most journalist in Delhi, foreign correspondent. He is president of the Foreign Correspondents Club, and he has been here uh, for, for donkey's years. Then we have General Sayyid Atta Hasnain, who was our core commander in Kashmir, and who keeps a very, very lively eye on these region, this particular region. Why? we shall come to at some stage. Awad, <coughs> the election, look, for three years there has been a civil war in Syria. The West, the Saudis, Qataris, and uh, the Turks, they were all, that they were demanding regime change. The aim was regime change. And now, the whole thing has turned around. Instead of regime change, uh, President Bashar al-Assad has gone and reasserted his presidentship yet again. Now, does this divide leave the Arab world as divided as it was? Absolutely, it will leave it as divided as ever because it was a win for the <coughs> Syrian people. It was not an election that was demanded for because of the war. The election was due in its due course and the election took place. Having said that, I wouldn't have said that the Syrian people are quite happy about the development in the ground because it was a very painful moment for all of us, though it was a joyous that to see the people, the exodus of people are flooding into the street despite the threat from the militants and the, the rebels are in the ground, yet they went and voted whether inside Syria or whether outside Syria. The clear message was they have voted for security, for stability, for prosperity of Syria. This is the general feeling among the Syrian people that we wanted the president who can retain the, the, the integrity and sovereignty of the nation and lead us for the next generation to come. And even now, I think this is election has given the first step toward a wider political reforms in Syria, which we might see a kind of a changes of the attitude of the previous kind of running of the government. Are you saying that the aftermath of these elections could well be that President Bashar al-Assad in his next innings will accommodate many of the impulses that are in fact at the moment with what is called the Syrian opposition? Absolutely. That is the message, actually. What, that is the very clear message from the ground. The people of Syria wanted a wider government. They want a reconciliation. They wanted a better governing. They wanted a better also accountability of the government and rebuilding of Syria. And I think if you could see the amount of people in the street, irrespective of their religion, they were Syrian first. And they have really voted in true spirit to show to the world that the Syrian people will be only people who are able to select and elect their own leaders to lead them in the future. And people have to respect that kind of a feeling among <coughs> the Syrian because there is not a single house in Syria, I can assure you, without anybody either injured or killed or there's a destruction of a house, including my own. So therefore, all of us wanted stability, want Syria to restore to what has been before the three years before this war was imposed on us. When you say this war was imposed, what do you mean? Who imposed it on you? Well, I'm, according to the American sources themselves, according to that they had a quarter of a million of mercenaries inside Syria, mm -hmm. and now only 100,000 have left. This is American sources. Mm -hmm. Even Peter, yesterday, the Ameri this, uh, from the this International uh, 
uh, International Center for uh, um, Radicalism Studies. Mm. He himself saying that there are uh, enough foreigners in Syria. Everybody of them, and the foreign, especially the European, mm. have tested the Syrian blood, and they are going <coughs> back. They are causing dangers to Europe. Mm. So they are saying it's a foreign war mm. fought on a Syrian, and the Syrian paying by their own blood. General, you as a strategist, as a military man, how do you cope with a situation where you have two distinct groups fighting together who in the initially <coughs> they were together and they were encouraged by the Americans and the Saudis and everybody. Now they have realized that one group is very powerfully <coughs> Al-Qaeda and the other is what they call uh, the Syrian, the, the more moderate opposition. Now this is the situation on the ground. How does General Atta Hassan look at it? Firstly, uh, let me say that uh, the signs, the, the signals being sent out by this very successful election are very positive. And one feels very encouraged by uh, looking at everything and whatever Dr. Awad just said. To just go into some very basic statistics, what I am told is that approximately 9 million people out of 23 million people were actually displaced. Mm. And despite that, you've had an almost 80% turnout in the elections mm. and no violence whatsoever. Which means that even the stakeholders, the people with deep, deep various interests in this area, allowed the electoral process to go through, mm. which has portents of something positive emerging. Having said that, I don't know, this whole war started essentially as a proxy war. Mm. You know, it's a proxy war between two ideologies. Sometimes people say it's a, it's a proxy war between two power centers. Mm -hmm. How does that suddenly come to an end with an electoral process successfully carried mm. out in Syrian heartland? I, I don't read too much into that. I don't think uh, the situation will immediately pan out to be one of success. I think we will have to wait for some more time before any signals are, are forthcoming mm. to say that actually there is peace which is being looked at. Mm. Well, you see, when it all started, it all started with the Arab Spring and when the convalescing king, the King Abdullah, he came out of hospital in Germany and he came mm. saw an altered world. Hosni Mubarak was gone. Uh, Zain, uh, Zainal Abdeen Ben Ali was gone and he said, what have you done? What have you done? He told the West and he said, now no emirate and no kingdom shall go. And then he more or less took charge and uh, Prince Bandar bin Sultan then jumped into, first of course, we, we go through the Libyan uh, theater. We shall not dilate on that because you, Libya is in a mess at the moment. And then began the, the war in, in Syria. This has gone on and on and on. All these countries were together. The Saudis, Qataris, and the Turks to begin with. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, silently, yes and no. But by and large, why has this coalition now splintered. Qatar and Saudis are not as much together as they were. Why? Well, they are the same uh, faces, different faces of the same <coughs> coin. The fact is that they will not do anything without the American uh, uh, consent. That's very clear picture. Mm -hmm. But I think what was the plan that because of the Arab Spring, Syria could also fall and they had easily like, like what happened in Libya, like what happened in the rest of the Arab world. So they, people took to the street thinking that they can do with little military help from outside and the rebels can take place, sleeping cell can come out, so the Syrian regime can go. Mm -hmm. But I think that three years down the line, we have realized that the people of Syria rallying more behind their president, the army, which is also taking on them, it's also very much supportive. We don't <coughs> have any major dis dis dissents on the army. Mm -hmm. That these are the sign where the Syrian people are really wanted to see a better future for themselves. Mm. Turkey and have realized Turkey is always having the remnant of the Ottoman Empire that they can rule the Arab world and they, this is how they, um, they, they, uh, they, they regain their, their, their glory. By, but they lost Libya, they lost Egypt, they lost Syria and they're losing themselves now because mm. whoever cooked the poison is testing it and they're testing the poison they cooked for Syria. Mm. 
Turkey, uh, Qatar paid the price by the prince and his, his foreign minister. They were dismissed because they misguided the American that it is an easy war on Syria. Hmm. The Saudis, Bandar bin Sultan and his cronies also, they have been shifted from there. They have been given another assignment. But I wouldn't say that they have cleared. At the, what we are looking at, what this election clearly must be sending out to everybody, that please leave the Syrian alone. Take off your hand of Syria. Let the Syrian people decide their future. <coughs> Unless and until the Arab country realize the importance of this, because we have 20,000 Saudi, 20,000 Libyan, 12,000 Tunisians. We have 8,000 from, from Jordan and from the Kuwait. So what do you want to do with these people when they go back? The Europeans themselves realize the danger of all these terrorist groups or all these rebels who tested the Syrian blood, who went back home and now they are taking revenge there. Why would we should put an end to this? So Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar money should stop. Turkey should close its border before we go. I think the Saudis are paying, going to pay a hefty price because the American intelligence and the studies now we'll hear from the Washington now, they are already talking of dividing Saudi Arabia. And until and unless the kingdom of Saudi, the alien king realized the vision of a pan-Arab to united the Arabs behind him, he will be falling apart like any other, other Arab countries. You have been talking about the AFPAC movement in the Middle East, which means after the Soviet <coughs> withdrawal, you had this backlash, the kickback from the Taliban and from the Mujahideen, which then spawned and became the, uh, the Al-Qaeda and the rest of it, the extremism that the world faces today. Now, a similar thing is cooking in Syria. In fact, it's cooking in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And it's one same region, just as, as you, in fact, mentioned the other day, that just as the Afghanistan and Pakistan <coughs> are one territorial, one theater of operations, here you've got a theater of operations, which is Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. Iraq. In fact, uh, it has been commonly called as SIL. Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, the Sil War now. And it takes you back to AFPAC. These acronyms are very interesting sometimes. And Dr. Awad actually just mentioned this aspect of the div diverse nationalities of people who are actually involved in this entire proxy war. This is exactly what happened in the, in the 80s, if you remember, mm. uh, when, the, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan. And we found mercenaries from all over the world, from this, particularly from the Islamic world, mm. who were sponsored by the Western world to fight in, in, in uh, Afghanistan. Mm. And in 89, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, subsequently you found they, they were jobless, mm. trained people, a lot of weaponry available. And that is what created all the turbulence around the APAC region all over again, in Kashmir for particular, for example. That's exactly the, 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 the example today which we can apply to the situation in Syria. The expanded arc of the conflict, the mm. SIL conflict, with all these non-state actors who are looking for jobs, essentially, in this area, not too ideology-oriented as such. You, when you find that an emerging peace will come by, these are the people who will return to their countries, as very correctly assessed by Dr. Awad, and the one, they are the ones who will create all the turbulence everywhere. Now, we can't be certain as to what their exact ideology will be at that time, but they will be the, the, the cannon fodder available for the, all the major terror groups of the world, the Al-Qaeda, the Boko Haram, the, the Al-Shabaab in, in, uh, in uh, Somalia. And so therefore what you find is one more crucible emerging from where all this terrorist activity is going to come about. 